Here's the sink. And here we go. Lexus all new IS. If Lexus wants to get them young, this is their best bet. Maybe their only bet. Suspensions that think. They're really just four major technology groups. And keeping the world out when the shiny side is down. Time to check the tech. We see cars differently. Nice. We love them on the road and under the hood, but also check the tech and are known for telling it like it is. Ugly is included at no extra cost. The good, the bad, the bottom line. This is CNET on Cars. Welcome to CNET on Cars, the show all about high-tech cars and modern driving. I'm Brian Cooley. You know, every year, it seems like about a handful of cars out of all the ones out there make up the majority of the email we get from you asking us to go review one model or the other. And this year, one of those was the Lexus IS, completely new. So we got our hands on an IS 350 all-wheel drive F-Sport. That's just about everything to check the tech. If Lexus wants to get them young, this is their best bet. Maybe their only bet. Let's drive the new 2014 IS, a 350 all-wheel drive in F-Sport trim, and check the tech. All right, spotting the new IS is pretty darn easy. Big, deep spindle grille, Lexus style, and look down at the rear quarter and see this incredible swoop that comes up off the sill and meets the outside brow of the tail lights. It's very different. It is a little bit longer. Check out that front seat leg room. I can actually put the driver's seat so far back, I can't even drive the car, which for me is saying something. Now, ordering an IS is like ordering hash browns at the Waffle House. A thousand combinations. 250 or 350. All-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive. F-Sport available on any combination of the above. So what's an F-Sport? It's basically better brakes, cooler wheels, adaptive suspension, and variable steering. No engine changes. Okay, inside this new IS cabin, it's a real handsome thing. They've gotten rid of some of the needless curved organic stuff and gotten a more angular look that I think fits a sporty car. The materials have been brought up as well. Nice faux aluminum, nice whatever this machine turned finish is, and all the pleather is really good quality too. Now, in the concept version of this car, they promised us two 12-inch LCDs. Well, you know concept cars. We ended up with considerably less. There is a 7-inch main LCD right there. Navigation doesn't look a whole lot different than it has before. Slightly childish in this very kind of cool interior. They've revised a lot of the cursor work on this car. And notice when you get on top of a button, it gets this big doughy glowing thing as well. So that's a nice, simple improvement. Here at the top menu, you also see we have the Lexus app suite. A lot of things live inside there that we have seen before, no major changes. And on Lexus cars, the connection to the internet is also through your phone. It's not built in the way BMW, Audi, and soon General Motors are all gonna do it. Some of those apps show up as media sources as well, as they should in one place, thank you. Here's our iPod right here and Bluetooth streaming as well. Let's take a look at how metadata forms from our iPod, for example. This is one of the better uses of the real estate to spell things instead of rotate scrolling them, which I hate in a car. Now, these guys are known for Mark Levinson Audio. That is optional as well. And notice you've got sound profiles per source, which I think might be new in this car. So I'm setting up my iPod sound curve now. That'd be separate from my FM radio, for example. Notice in all of this, I would absolutely kill. I mean kill for a back button that isn't on the screen only. I need a button right here under my thumb. Which brings us to this haptic feedback touch thing. They call it remote touch, I think. It's like an upside down puck. It debuted in the RX a few years ago. And it's just not precise or positive enough. I think it needs to go. I'd kill for a knob with a click right now. 235 2nd Street, San Francisco, California. Two, three, five, Second Street, San Francisco, California. Is this correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, the key two tests were passed. I can enter the address in one long phrase, not bucket by bucket by bucket, and it got it on the first try. 
It was kind of slow, though, doing its processing, but that doesn't distract you from driving as much as those other failings would have. Now, this layback console, I think, is genius. It's the only one I can think of in the car biz that's exactly at the angle of your fingertips when you pivot your elbow. No one else does that. It's so simple. Unfortunately, too much of it is squandered on climate control. These are your temperature thingies. Uh, they're a sensor strip. I don't need that. That's really just tech filigree. What I really want is just a damn knob, which still works better than anything else. Here's a huge gripe. What do you use more than anything except the gas pedal and steering wheel when you drive? The volume knob. This one you can never get to. Looks easy, right? Well, think about it. If you go this way, bang, your hand hits the gear shifter wherever it is. Ouch. If you try and go this way, it's this kind of tortured little twist of your wrist. If you go this way, you can't quite reach it around the gear shift. There's no easy way to get to that thing. That's a huge screw up. I'm pleased how they've done the seat heaters, though. And remember, little things add up on a car when you live with it for years. Lots of these electronic switches reset every time you restart the car. What's also clever is when you get back in the car when it's cold, it automatically goes to three, which will throw you for a minute. But what it's doing, it's fast heating. And then it gradually stops itself down to the one that I had before. Well thought out. Very Lexus. Now, drive controls. One choice only, automatic gearbox, not a dual clutch. We'll talk about how many gears when we get to the engine bay. But it's right here with a shiftable gate here to go up and down shift. Also, you can get on the paddles, of course, they're wheel mounted. And blessedly simple personality control over here. You go counterclockwise to put it in eco mode, which you might do once in a while. Push the thing to go back to normal. Turn it once to go to sport, which is going to sharpen up transmission and accelerator behavior. Turn it again for sport plus, which will add sharper suspension and steering behavior. Now the real crowd pleaser. Let's go to the instrument panel, which they borrowed some of the technology of from the LFA supercar. And I hate to break their hearts, but it should have stayed there. Here's the trick. You push the menu button here on the wheel, and whee, there we go. That gauge in the middle, which is a video gauge, moves to the right on a little motor, then exposing a whole bunch of additional menus you've got to the left of it. When don't I want to see all those menus on the left? When do I want to see less in my interface? It's not often. And I don't want my wallet within a mile of that dealership when the little motor that does this breaks. And they got to, I assume, dig all this out to get to it. No thanks. Now up here in the bow, we've got a three and a half liter V6 because this is a 350. To get a 250, you can fill in the blanks. This V6 is sitting longitudinally, drives the rear wheel standard, drives the front wheels and the rear all wheel drive in our optional configuration here. Your transmission is interesting. If you get rear wheel drive, you get an eight speed automatic. If you get all wheel drive, you get a six speed automatic. That's what we're going to be driving today. You've got multi-port as well as direct injection on the intake side here. The logic goes that multi-port is better for cruising or idle performance, but direct injection is better when you're on the throttle. So I'm seeing a combination here, which adds some complexity, but seems to pay off. MPG, 19 city, 26 highway. 28 highway if you get rear wheel drive. 306 horsepower, 277 foot pounds of torque, gets this 3,700 pound car up to 60 and 5.7. It's a tenth slower than the rear wheel drive. You don't give up much. Okay, underway, the biggest complaint I have about this car that I share with a lot of others is a kind of sleepy soft gearbox. The shifts are kind of slow, and this guy gets caught in its top two gears way too often, way too much. They've got a great engine note in this car as well. You can hear that. And you can even set the tack to go red when you hit a preset RPM limit. That's a lot of nice theater, but it helps to inject a certain DNA you don't think of in a Lexus. The ride is tuned towards softness, not the same precision I would expect out of, let's say, a 335 IS, but it's got a certain lack of precision at the really sharp edge. Here's the bottom line for a buyer's tip. This car, among athletic sports sedans, I think is the most comfortable riding. Not sloppy, but comfortable. And that sets it apart, I think, from a lot of the German and even American and Asian competition that tend to punish you from underneath. This car you will feel refreshed in after a long drive, if not quite as exhilarated from after a short twisty drive. Okay, let's price this guy. A 14 IS350 is going out at about 40,003. 2200 bucks or so more for all wheel drive. Note that there are some sacrifices there. You lose variable steering, you get a 14 inch bigger turning circle, and you get a six speed, not an eight speed. I'd go rear. Now, the big package that takes you totally see that style is 7700 bucks to throw everything on this car, including a few tech I didn't even show you on here. 
This brings the car up to 50,003 CNET style. It's a fair amount of change, but this car is a nice blend of performance to the degree that you can actually use it and comfort to the degree that you will always appreciate it. Check out our full review on the IS350 over at cars.cnet.com for all the details. Now, I bet you think of the roof of your car as basically a way to keep the sunroof out of your lap. It's not very interesting, right? Wrong. There's been a huge technical revolution going on in roof and pillar design. Could save your life. And that's of interest to the smarter driver. Now, two major good things happen when your roof is strong and stays intact. First of all, the roof doesn't intrude and injure passengers or kill them inside the vehicle. But secondly, the belt, the airbags, the windows, and the windshield have a strong base, so they can stay in place and do their job keeping you from leaving the car, which is a big problem in rollovers. Only about 2% of the nation's roughly 9 million annual car accidents are rollovers, but they typically account for an astonishing 33% of fatalities. So say hello to a tougher roof standard. Now, new federal standards for roof rollover strength were passed in 2009. They started phasing in September of 2012 and full phase in across the entire fleet of new vehicles sold in the U.S. as of 2017 model year cars. Now, before these new standards that kicked in in 2012, we go back to 1973 for the last time roof crush specs were set. And back then, the federal standard was only that it had to withstand one and a half times the weight of the vehicle. Today, that's a poor rating. That would not even be a passing grade. Now, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety awards those coveted rollover standards based on a test where they come right here with a big machine that tries to deflect this part of the roof. Five inches total deflection. The question is, how much weight does it take? That's where they come up with a ratio based on the car's weight. To get a good rating, which is the best, there has to be a four to one ratio. In other words, the roof can support four times the car's weight of an impact. Now, there are some downsides to all this additional roof strength performance. A couple trivial ones, and that is there's an estimate that it costs maybe $54 more in your car's MSRP to create all this stronger structure, and $16 to $62 in additional fuel consumption due to some added weight. Those are small numbers, but there is a bigger concern. And that is this. As these pillars get stronger, they're getting thicker. Add to that the airbags that are in them, the padding here for federal head impact standards, and the increasing slope for aerodynamics, and you've got a visibility problem. University of Michigan did a study that found these increasingly thick pillar designs make invisible for a substantial time a pedestrian who could be in your path during a typical left turn at an intersection, let's say. In the EU, such outward visibility is regulated. In the US, it's not. The IIHS has roof crush ratings by car model on its site. And since these new standards are being phased in, it pays to double check. So bottom line, when you look at your car next time and see the roof and the pillars and think you're just seeing something to keep the rain out and keep the glass in place, mm -mm, you're looking at some pretty serious engineering that has come a long way in a few years towards saving your life. Coming up, four flavors of high-tech suspension explained when CNET on Cars continues. I think this is going to be a good one. In 2009, I think someone in the Aston Martin development office was on some kind of really potent drug. A little voice popped up and went, uh, lads, how about we put the DBS's V12 in advantage? I have one message for whoever that was. Keep taking your drugs, son, because this thing is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> More 
your love of cars at cnet.com slash xcar. Welcome back to CNET on Cars, coming to you from our home at the Marin Clubhouse of Cars du Idiac, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, one big area of car tech innovation is actually hidden from view. It lives under the haunches and fenders of your vehicle. It's your suspension, which is no longer just a collection of dumb rods and springs. Adaptive suspension in four flavors makes for an interesting car tech 101. On this Jaguar XJ, for example, I've got drive controls that include a sport mode, a dynamics mode, and those speak to the adaptive suspension, which Jag's engineers say allowed them to monitor for almost 900 parameters of the vehicle's relationship with the road and gravity, up from about 80 on a typical dead steel spring suspension. Now, whether you're monitoring 80 or 800 parameters of suspension and vehicle relationship with the road, they're really just four major technology groups that get that done. There's active pneumo hydraulic. This mouthful uses a combination of pumps and accumulators to move hydraulic fluid and compressed nitrogen gas to the car's four corners as needed in milliseconds to take over the functions of both shock absorption and sway control. It's very exotic and expensive. We've driven it on the McLaren MP412C, where it keeps the car almost oddly level in corners, but also kept the ride compliant. Then there's active electromagnetic. This system replaces all that pneumo hydraulic plumbing and pumping with linear electric motors at each corner. Its response can be even faster, and it doesn't strew plumbing all over the car. The Bose company of audio fame, oddly enough, is well known as an innovator in this technology, and it actually derives some of the basics from the study of waves and electromagnetics, a lot like speakers. Okay, that's active. Now on to the adaptive or semi-active technologies. These are so named because all they do is react to what the road and the car are doing. They don't actually bring their own forces to that relationship. First up is adaptive solenoid or adaptive valve. Now your typical shock works by passing hydraulic fluid through a series of small valves or orifices, which limit the rate that fluid can move back and forth. That limits the movement of the shock and therefore the movement up and down of the car. Adaptive valve or solenoid tech gives you electronic control over those shock valves. So the rate at which fluid moves around inside the shock can be changed on the fly, therefore varying the shock's damping behavior. That brings us to adaptive magneto rheological. It's a mouthful, but perhaps the fastest growing adaptive suspension right now. This GM developed system uses a special kind of shock fluid with particles suspended in it that react to electric current. And simply put, that makes the fluid present itself to the mechanism more or less viscous. And that varies the damping effect in very subtle ways that can be changed very rapidly and with great range just by varying the current you apply to the fluid. Oh, by the way, if you see a wire coming off a shock absorber like this here in the center of the shock tower, that's a dead giveaway. You've got adaptive suspension. In this case, magneto rheological technology, and this is the current flowing through here. Now, so far, these adaptive suspension systems have gone in two directions. One is for extremely high-performance cars, and the other is for very luxurious high comfort vehicle applications. Uh, we're not seeing these show up in a lot of mainstream cars yet because they don't have an everyday efficiency component. They're never gonna save you any MPG or make the car any less expensive. So what we're talking about here is a still mid to upper class tech if you wanna divide the car market that way. But as this technology comes down in price, as of course it will, expect to see it on more cars in the sub $30,000 class. Up next, top five ways expensive car tech is making it to your car when CNET on Cars returns. The Porsche Boxster was seen as the poor relation to the full fat, hardcore. 911. Its doors were from a 911, as were its headlamps. It was seen as a bit of a Franken car, a poor relation made up of offcuts for the cheap. Which is a shame, really. The first generation Boxster was said to have saved the company from a buyout. It was a huge volume seller thanks to its comparatively low price, keen handling, and plentiful go. 
However, it's not until now in the third generation 981 that the Boxster gets its own doors. It looks like Porsche is getting a bit serious about this one. More love of cars at CNET.com slash XCar. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. This is the part of the show where we answer some of your emails about questions you'd like us to look into or reactions to past segments, which is what we have on our hands this time. This comes in from Bart, who says, is there such a thing as too much oil changing, too frequent? I run synthetic oil in my diesel car and change it when the dashboard trip computer tells me to. But could it harm the engine if I change it too often? Uh, no, uh, you can't harm the engine by changing your oil too often. You can harm your wallet, though, Bart. Our friends at Edmunds took an exhaustive look at this recently and found that this whole 3,000-mile oil thing is an old myth based on 50 years of habit from much older cars and those little stickers the oil change places put on your windshield after you go have your oil done there. Of course, it's in their interest that you change your oil more often. In fact, the head of research at the AAA said there is absolutely no improvement in vehicle longevity or MPG by changing your oil more frequently than the manufacturer says, and that's usually way higher than 3,000 miles. Calculation would tell us that 2,000, maybe $3,000 can be wasted by an owner in the first 100,000 miles of owning their car by changing their oil every 3,000 miles versus 5,000, 7,500, some cars say only every 10,000. Engines and oil have changed, and it's about time our oil change habits do as well. Now, something else that's changed a lot is how fast the really good safety tech comes down from the huge dollar luxury cars down to the cars that we can afford. It used to take years for that stuff to trickle down. Now it happens maybe just a model year or two later, and I've got a top five to prove it. Number five, adaptive cruise control. This is the tech that not only maintains your speed, but also the distance between you and the car ahead. It debuted in Japan on the high-end Mitsubishi Diamante in 1995. Didn't come to the US until 2000 on the Lexus LS430. Today, it's fairly common. You'll find it on cars as affordable as the Mazda 6, even the Mitsubishi Outlander. And look for big growth here, largely because the same parts and software that make this system work also enable forward collision avoidance tech. It's kind of a twofer. Number four is the rear view camera. Go back to 1956 to find the first on the Buick Centurion, a show car, but there it was way back then. Then it just went away. We never saw one again until the early 2000s when LCDs began to show up in the dash and that gave the camera image a place to live. Today, almost all cars at least offer them but there's still too often optional equipment, even on a Bentley Flying Spur. The feds have repeatedly balked in terms of making these required, and so they're still typically optional. Number three is the airbag. The 74 Olds Tornado was perhaps the first production car with what they then called the air cushion restraint system. Had a very low take rate, so it kind of drifted and went away. Then in 81, Mercedes put it front and center on the new S-Class, and you know their reputation for safety. By 1989, front airbags for the driver were required, and by 1998, across the front row. Today, you can hardly count the number of airbags in most cars. 10, 11, 12 is quite common. Number two, ABS, anti-lock brakes. March of 1969, ABS arrives on the Concorde. Then in 1970, Ford made it optional on the rear wheels of Continentals, and in 1971, Chrysler made it available on four wheels in the Imperial. The EU has required it on all cars since 2007, but get this, the US still doesn't. Some mumbo jumbo about how to accurately test its effectiveness. As of 2012, however, I think I stopped seeing any cars sold without it in the US, regardless of regulations. Before I get you to number one, here are a couple technologies that won't be that. Lane keep assist and blind spot monitoring. That's because, so far, insurance industry data shows rather tepid improvement in driver safety with those technologies. They just aren't making a big difference yet. The number one trickle-down safety tech has got to be ESC, Electronic Stability Control. It first shows up in really polished form on the big Mercedes and BMWs of 1987. Then, as of model year 2012, it's now required on all new cars in the U.S. Simply put, stability control is unbelievable. It reduces fatal rollovers by 70% and reduces all fatal crashes in cars by 14% and double that in SUVs. In many ways, it's kind of a cure for the lousy driver. 
Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for checking it out. A lot of ways to reach me on Twitter. I'm Brian Cooley, facebook.com slash askcnet, or email oncars at cnet.com. I read all those personally, by the way. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time we check the tech. Okay, I think we're good there.